Hey everybody, this is Mike. Uh, welcome back to the shop. Um, I'm going to try to give a little rundown. There's a lot of debate going on. Well, it's been going on for quite a while on some of the forums <clears throat> about uh, MIG welding, stack of dimes, uh, MIG like TIG, uh, you name it. There's all kinds of uh, terminology they're using for it. Um, basically what they're trying, what, what people are trying to accomplish is that overlaying of the beads to make much like the looks of a TIG. A TIG welder, you get that by creating a puddle. When you dip the rod, it cools the puddle and it freezes it in a sense. Then you move the arc ahead, you uh, create another puddle, you dip the rod, all while, continuing, all while maintaining a continuous arc. Um, first off, I'm going to say right off the bat, uh, there's a lot of haters out there of this process. Uh, I shouldn't say process, of this technique. There's a lot of haters out there of this technique. Um, you know, everybody's entitled to their opinion. Um, this is just mine, and this has been going on for several years now, and I got news for you, it's probably going to continue going on for decades. There are people that flat out say that it is a, it is a poor form of welding, a poor technique, it'll fail, um, you name it. <laughs> I hate to say it, it's not an easy technique to learn, but it is achievable. If I can do it, anybody can do it. Uh, I'm not a welder by profession, I'm a mechanic who knows how to weld and fabricate. Um, I understand the difference between a weld certification for the last 10 years, well, up until, up until two years ago, I let it last. But for 10 years prior to that, I was certified in AWSD 1.1 4G in stick, so uh, shielded metal arc welding up to one inch, TIG, uh, gas tungsten arc welding up to one inch in steel and stainless steel and aluminum, and MIG up to one inch, uh, uh, gas metal arc welding. So I've been through the certifications. Um, in my opinion, certifications are a whole other thing. Um, I know people that are, that are damn, damn good welders and they're not certified. I also know certified welders that can weld whatever that one particular thing is that they're certified in. So don't get me started on certifications. I, sometimes they're not worth the paper they're printed on. However, for some jobs, some applications, a certification is just basically saying, I can do this specific task, this, this direction, this, whether it be horizontal, vertical, overhead, and I can get it to pass an x-ray or ultrasonic testing. That's basically all certification is. It's not a right to weld by any means, it's just some jobs require that. Um, my company paid me to get certified because we had some jobs come up that uh, needed a certified welder. And I volunteered to say, hey, pay for my certification. Um, I always wanted to see if I could pass the certification. Hey, pay for my certification. I'll weld, I'll do the welding that's required, and then you just pay to keep it up. And th that, they did that up until two years ago when we let it lapse. But this, this technique will not pass a weld certification. Um, due to where the ripples intersect, um, they call it inclusion. Um, there's a, they could cause a form of a crater there. I can see in theory, yes, if you're welding nuclear power plants or um, boiler pipes, so forth. Yeah, this is not the process. This is not the technique you want to use. Um, you'll, 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 you, you know how to. You'd have to bump your wire speed, voltage, everything up, and you've got a nice, smooth, consistent mid weld. In my opinion, a good welder can use the technique needed for that application. That's all I'm going to say on that. When we're talking about the cursive E, the MIG like TIG, the stack of dimes MIG weld, this is something that became very popular um, back in, you know, a few years back in, in the, in the uh, uh, desert racing uh, motorsports arena, and it's just really caught on by leaps and bounds. People, people see it, and that's what they want. Well, like, like I said, I'm a, I'm a mechanic by trade, and I know how to weld and fabricate just because I wanted to, I wanted to weld and fabricate my own stuff rather than take it somewhere else. So I'm a mechanic who learned how to weld and fabricate. I'm 100% self-taught. I've read a lot. I've experimented, experimented, experimented a lot. I've been an industrial maintenance mechanic for 26 plus years now. I, this, I'm not, this isn't new. This is my first, this is my first rodeo. And like I said, there's a lot of haters out there that say that this is a, this is a bad technique to use. And maybe they can't do it. Maybe that's why they, they say it's a bad technique. I don't know. I don't want to, it's just, it's, they're entitled to their opinion. However, 
if you my, my, my view was is I had people coming to me, clients asking me, can you do this? They'd seen a picture, or some of them even had a picture. Can you do this type of welding? That's what I want. And to be honest with you, if I wanted the business, I had to learn how to do it. That's what the customer wanted. That's what the person was paying me to do. That's what I needed to deliver. So I looked at it as I either need to sink or swim. So I learned how to do it. And there are people that are far better at it than I. I commend them on that. And everybody, if you, if you Google it, you'll see who I'm talking about. There are some great welders out there on uh, racedesert.com, weldingweb.com, uh, welding tricks. Uh, tipsandtricks.com. There's a lot of great welders out there. Um, I'm probably only scratching the surface on some of the, uh, some of the forums that are out there. Uh, this is not a debate to say who's what what process this process is better than another. This is just to show you my take on it. That's all it is. Take it for whatever it's worth, and you know it's the internet, so you can't put anything on there that isn't true. <laughs> anyway. Uh, a couple of things I want to point out real quick before I go into too deep into it. When I've tried to help people with this, whether it be at work or just trying to help a friend or something, get kind of get a feel for it, I've found one thing that's common is they'll, they'll, make, a, they'll make a pass and, and, and after they lift their hood, they'll stand back and go, oh, what am I doing up there? And, you know, I was trying to roll down here. One thing I've run across when I'm trying to assist people with this is they can't see whether it be their angle or whatever, and I, I have to kind of laugh whenever I see somebody. I was down at my local welding supply store the other day, and they had a, a picture up of a welder sitting there, nice and straight back, sitting there on his, his stool with his one hand out there with a, with a MIG gun in his hand, sitting out there, pose. I had to laugh to myself, because I don't know any welder who does that. It, or, of course, maybe, maybe I'm doing it wrong, but get, don't be afraid to get your hood down, get your head down in there where you can see if you can't see the puddle, you can't see where you're going, you can't well. You have to be able to see what you're doing. So that said, um, I, I like everybody's entitled to their, uh, everybody has their personal preferences. I learned to weld with a little, oh, what were they, two by three um, uh, view, view uh, window, a uh, welding lens, and the old Huntsman helmet. And that's what I learned to weld with back when I was, back when I was on the farm in my early, early years, my dad teaching me. As I, as I got older, got into the industrial um, field, into the profession a little more, I started learning, reading more, buying books, learning, trying different techniques. Um, I, I like the 3x5, the bigger, the bigger window hoods. I'm old school. I still like the old flip down helmets. Um, once you get your tension set right on them, you know, a little quick nod, boom, the helmet's down, and you're good to go. It's it's this is a, I think this is the Jackson. I had this in probably 10, 12 years. I had a Huntsman before that, and I literally put so many headgear in it that it quit. It, it, it opened out the holes, and I couldn't. It wouldn't hold the headgear anymore. So I bought this one. It's not expensive by any means, but it's like anything else. It, it becomes like second nature to you. Um, my wife bought me. And this is another rage right now. This is the auto darkening helmets. They're great. I'm not bad mouthing them. I particularly don't care for things to take batteries anymore. I have to. It seems like every time you turn around, the battery's either dead or you're, you're changing out batteries. My wife bought me this one um, about six, eight years ago. And you can see it is pretty bumped up, up on the tip, top of my head, uh, up on the top of the hood there. Um, I do use it on occasion, but the thing I found this works the greatest for is if you need to get your head stuck up underneath an axle or between a frame and a, a leaf spring or, or something where you, you can't flip that hood down. You, it's nice because it's clear. You stick your head up in there. You see where you need to go position. So you strike the arc, boom, you've got your, you've got your uh, um, tinted lens. You can, they're vary between, oh, uh, well, I think you can vary these pretty much between about uh, 9 and 12 or 13, somewhere around there. So they are, they are variable, like, like I said, they have their place, but for me personally, I always grab my old trusty, um, just manual hood. Um, I'm, while I'm talking about that, pick yourself up some clear protective lenses so you protect the lens, the shaded lens. These are cheap, I buy them by the box, and they're a lot cheaper that way, but um, I clean a few. I'm not saying every 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 string, every uh, bead you lay down, you got to change the thing. But you'll know when you get when you know what you're looking for, and you start having to squint a little bit more normal, and you, you've wiped it off, and 
It's just not there. Change it out. If you, if you can't see, you can't weld. So um, that's all I'm going to say about that. Uh, another thing I want to touch on real quick is, is placement. I mentioned in the, in the picture I saw where the guy was sitting there straight back and he's gun out, yeah, out there. One-handed, I'm sure there are people that can do it. I've had to do it in a pinch where I have to lean my shoulder up underneath a frame or, or something and, and reach my other arm up around a, a frame rail and, and hold the gun with the other hand and sometimes you just prop it against something and make and, and rest your gun, your gun hand against it. You do what you have to in those situations. I would say probably 95% of the time I use both hands. Um, I'm left-handed. That means my, uh, my gun hand is my left hand. I feel sorry for you right-handers because you know you got, you got an uphill battle right there against you anyway. It's left-handers who got this shit figured out. <laughs> anyway, um, so when you grab your gun, you can see my, 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 uh, I've got all these, these uh, pads on there. Trust me, it's not asbestos. No one be anybody thinking freaking out with asbestos. But these are great. They're cheap. They're less than 20 bucks, I think they are, 16, 18 bucks. And they're just a, a guard. This is actually probably about ready to be replaced. It's starting to fray pretty good on me. But it does uh, keep the heat away. Um, you can see where, it's, where my gun usually, majority of the time my gun rests right there. You can see that my glove, my, my pad and everything is contoured right there for it. Um, down there, you, 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 squeeze, you squeeze the trigger, get your pedal going, and you're moving. You're, 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 you're moving the, I use my left hand as my, as my, uh, to get the motion in, and my right hand is actually what I use as the guide. Other time, the, my next favorite hold is just, I put my thumb, and basically you're putting pressure, the gun against your thumb, and then your pinky's out. Uh, you know, they say about your pinky being out, but like, it's not true, trust me. Anyway, put your pinky down, and I usually, as soon as I go up to pull up something, I'll take a dry run on it. Reach, I, I, depending on how far you want to go, you want to see start to finish. If you, if you can go start to finish, sometimes you think, well, I might have to reach a little further than normal to start, but then fairly early in the well, I'm going to be in a comfortable position, and then I end up coming back and I, well, and I end in a comfortable position. If I can't do that, I'll break it up into halves or thirds or however, and then, and, and then tie it in with my well. So those are the two most common. Like I said, I've done it the other way where I have to reach around a frame and hold the, hold the gun while I manipulate. So whatever works for you, but be prepared to use two hands and be prepared to get your head down in there. I, I've never measured it, but I would dare say when I'm welding, I'm probably in the ten, probably 10 inches from the, uh, from the tip of the nozzle to my hood. Um, sometimes closer, some, but very seldom, very any further away. Uh, another another quick hint is I always keep a pair of, just a cheap, cheap pair of dikes handy. Um, sometimes when you stop welding, you'll have a little nub on the end of your wire, uh, a little ball that's sometimes two, two and a half times the diameter. I'm, I'm, I run 030 wire, by the way. Um, keep a pair of dikes handy. Put a little snip on it. Two reasons. Number one, you're not putting that contamination back into your well. Second of all, is it takes a lot less current to get that little that 030 wire going, and you get a much smoother, consistent start than you do, like say, with a 80, 90 thousandths um, diameter ball in it. That takes a lot of current to melt that to melt that ball off. So that's another reason. And and if you happen to, like say. I'll just reach in and snip it, and I found that I'm actually snipping it at a bit of an angle. So now you're taking that wire, and uh, by snipping it at an angle like that, you're creating a height, a point in essence. So that's where that current's going to start. Boom, the rest of the wire comes into it, melts in. You get a nice crisp start. You don't end up with that crackling and popping as you're trying to start an arc. You start to squeeze the trigger, you should get a nice instant sizzle. And then you start going right to welding. So, okay, I'm going to take a stab at this here. Um, like I said before, I'm a mechanic, I'm not a, an artist. So, uh, that's what I've found when I'm trying to help somebody learn this or, 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 or experiment with this technique is use um, a couple of, you know, quarter, 3 16 inch plate, quarter inch plate, um, and use an open corner joint. Um, stand two pieces up so it leaves you a valley tack each in. The reason why that's easy to learn with is because it gives you, a, basically the two edges of that are going to give you guides to stay between. Um, it's, just, it's, just, it's just easy to focus on the technique and, the, and watching your penetration 
more so than uh, where am I going. So it's, it's just an easy test to learn. You'll use the same thing for other other uh, lap joints or tees or whatever. But basically, this is a good one to learn on. And you, like I said, you're going to be you're going to be making that and that loop. But it's basically series of these. I'm I'm left-handed. I mentioned that earlier. Uh, I, I kind of, I guess I got an advantage over you right-handed people out there. So um, I'm making a backwards E. Right-handers will be going right to left, or excuse me, left to right. We'll be making a, a standard cursive E or an elongated L, however you want to look at it. Um, I'm uh, left-handed. I'm going from right to left. I usually use about a 10, 15 degree pull angle and um, get down in, on, on, the, on the right side of my hand so I can watch the puddle. And I've used this crescent C shape before. It, it, it does okay, but you, you want to be careful using that because you really want to stay on the front leading edge of this puddle at all times. When you're welding, you want to watch that leading edge, and, and that's the business end. That's where your fusion, that's where you're watching that wire dig in, bite into the root of that weld, and then basically you're backing up and kind of filling up to those two to the two edges. Or you know, whatever whatever part you're welding on. So you want to stay on that leading edge. If you're just making big loops and you're going back over the top of yourself and you're, you're kind of going over over, over the, 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 the root or the depth, the, the deep part of the, of the weld, you, you're not creating a sound solid weld. This, <clears throat> this technique is not to be taken lightly because you still, first and foremost, have to have a solid sound weld. Um, if it, it, it's better, it's better to learn and know how to know how to watch the puddle, watch it um, uh, bite in. Uh, even, though, even if you go forward and then you come back half, go forward, come back half that distance, and you watch it bite in. Learn, learn to watch that puddle and read the puddle because if your toes aren't wetting out, if you're not staying on the leading edge of that, you're not getting a sound weld, and you. You do not want to sacrifice the weld strength for appearance. This is a, a technique that's going to amplify your appearance of your weld, but you still, first and foremost, want to put down a solid weld. I've used this C pattern before. If I have a, a slight gap to fill, again, I don't like to fill gaps. I'm, I, I'm much more, uh, I try to be disciplined in, in getting my fitment tight. Um, that's, the, that's the first and foremost. Get, 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 get your fitment up, it's like building a house, you know, everybody's going to build on that foundation, and if your fitment is bad, you're going to have to struggle, even for an experienced welder, some, I've had some gaps that I've had to fill out in the field that are, are less than ideal, and if you're trying to learn, you're just compounding that learning process, that compounding that problem, so fit, fit your parts well, tack them good, and then concentrate on welding rather than filling gaps, so fit your parts up well, practice on welding, um, like I said, again, you want to stay on the leading edge of that puddle. So, um, let's see, I think, so here, here's, like, here's, here's a, a, another illustration. This is kind of, if you're looking straight down on it, you're basically going to be moving, a, moving ahead, pushing it forward, and then you just loop back, and you're pushing that leading edge forward, looping back, pushing that leading edge forward, and you're just kissing the two sides. So you want to make that, the width of that weld bead, consistent. That's why you're going in motion. You want to push it to one edge, push it to the other, push it to one edge, but you always want to stay on the leading edge of that puddle. You're just coming back enough, basically you're not coming back to come back onto it, you're coming back to push that puddle out to the other side. So, you, so you're working on your whip, your consistency. Um, one thing I found on this is you will be running a lower voltage and a lower wire speed than normal. So you can use your gate, your uh, charts on the side of your welders, the little the Miller makes the little slide rules. Those are okay for starting points, but I've found you usually end up tossing those and keep, I used to keep a little notepad for my welder at work was different than the one I had at home here. So the different, different, different welders have, even the, same, even the same, same brand, same series, they have, can have a different inductance to the transformer and they will, they have their own personality. So I like to get consistent with a particular welder and I've kept little notes. I do the same thing here. I've got a little book that I jot down in whenever I find a new uh, a new favorite setting, or especially, or even if I'm working on something that's 
that's new as far as thicknesses or angular or whatever, and I find the, 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 the hot setup for that, and I'll jot it down. So it's, do yourself a favor and then uh, keep those for yourself. As you get older, it's, uh, it's, sometimes you can't remember what you had for breakfast the next the morning prior, so let alone remember all these specs. So let me go ahead and get set up. I'm going to see if I can make a couple of passes and demonstrate it uh, through, through, a, through a, a welding helmet. Okay, uh, getting ready to do a demonstration of weld here, and I thought about a couple things real quick. Um, I've never seen these mentioned, or either on videos I've watched or on forums, so um, I thought it would be worth mentioning. Um, I've walked into people's shops before, and I've seen their cords coming around their machines like that, and a hard turning coming out of the welder. Um, it's a good idea to keep your, your uh, cord, your hose, your uh, lead, very gradual bands. The, the liners in these things can get expensive over time. Um, you, know, you spend a lot of money for your equipment, go ahead and take care of it while you're at it. Two things. One, you have to come out, be a nice, nice curvature, and um, even, even before I use your well, I'll reach back and either make sure it's not coiled, make sure it's got a nice gradual curve to it, but where it comes out of your machine here, if you have it pulled out like that, to where it's coming out at an angle, it's real easy for somebody, either yourself or, or somebody else in the shop, to walk by and step on it. When they do, that pulls that down, and it's really hard on these ends. So we, what I'll tell you is what I'll do, and it's just become habit now, I'm so used to doing it, is once I get things ready, I'll just put a little, I'll kick it back a little bit so it makes a gradual curve come out of the machine, but that way I can walk up and have, if I happen to step on it accidentally, I'm not going to pull the ink down on that end of that where it goes into the machine, the connection. So, like I said, I just give a little kick, push it back in there. Um, I also mentioned about keeping the end clip back to keep the pair of dikes handy. Um, that, that's kind of the, that I thought that would be worth mentioning. Keep a nice gradual curve going there. Um, got, my, got my specs all set up here. So I'm going to go ahead and um, put the camera over here behind the lens and see if I can uh, demonstrate this technique. Okay, here's a, here's a vertical down, uh, gun angle was about uh, 10 degrees upwards, and I, once, I, once I rounded this top edge and I come down, I just did the same thing, loop down into the root, and then come around to get my width, wet my toes in, the toes have wet in nice, and then go down into the root, come around to get my width, dip into the root, and tra traverse down. Okay, here's, uh, I got the lens removed. Um, you see where I come in and I started, I got my puddle width, and then I moved down into the root. Again, here probably about a 15, maybe a 20 at the most. It's probably closer to a 15 degree gun angle. And I got down into the root, and then I made a loop up. You can see where the toes have wet in nice, there's no undercutting. Um, then I come back down into the root again, and then back out to wet the toes in. Basically, like I said, the loop is to make sure the width of the weld is consistent. And then you move forward. Move forward, always stay on the leading edge of that puddle. Basically, I just pause it a little bit at the top, and, and then where it's biting in, and then drop, because gravity, drop down into the root, come forward, drop down into the root, come forward, and that's how I get the um, width on it. Um, this is somewhat out of position. I apologize with the camera and everything there, but 
I hope that that helped demonstrate the technique through the through the lens and then also the after what it looks like when it's done. So again, that's just my take on the MIG like TIG or the stack of dimes with the MIG gun or whatever you want to call it. So that's uh, my technique and uh, I hope that's able to help somebody.